Welcome back to the Regent Law Podcast. On today's episode, we talk to Julianne Fleischer, who practices religious liberty work in Southern California. I think you're really going to enjoy this episode as we talk about why what she does matters for all Americans, not just religious ones. Enjoy. Hello, uh, welcome back to the show. And Julianne, I just want to say welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Of course, this is the Regent Law Podcast. We're really excited to talk to you today, uh, specifically about a recent victory you had in court. Uh, Excited to tell our listeners about that. But before we do that, I'd like to introduce you to them. So uh, maybe you can tell me, um, let's see, name, where you're from, where you currently practice, um, and your practice area. Okay, so my name is Julianne Fleischer. I am an attorney uh, practicing in Southern California. Uh, I'm a Regent Law uh, 2020 graduate, and I currently work at a legal ministry nonprofit law firm uh, called Advocates for Faith and Freedom. And uh, we primarily focus on religious liberty. Uh, We do some free speech, some election integrity uh, matters, parental rights as well. But I would say a big focus is religious liberty. Oh, that's really cool. And sorry, you said that Southern California. Did you say the city? Uh, So the law firm is in Marietta, California. And where are you from originally? I'm about 45 minutes uh, from Marietta, so born and raised in Ontario, California. I currently live in Chino, but a born and raised Southern California girl. There you go. There you go. Yeah. So, so for some of our listeners, if you don't know where Regent Law is, it's basically 44 hours east of there mm-hmm. uh, on I-40 in Virginia Beach. So, you know, here we are both graduates of Regent Law. So how did you end up going to Regent Law if you grew up in Southern California? By the grace of God. Uh, so I actually, when I graduated from high school, I moved out to Virginia for undergrad. I didn't go to Regent. I went to Liberty for undergrad. And uh, law school actually was not uh, in in part of my plan at all. Uh, I had grown up in a church uh, with a pastor who was Um, very passionate about getting his congregation involved in culture uh, in any field, whatever that looked like, but uh, engaging the culture with the gospel and with truth. And so when I was going to college, I had, you know, this idea that I wanted to go uh, maybe work in government, uh, but maybe go work for some type of think tank organization that focused Mm -hmm. on Uh, either religious uh, freedom or family policy. And so I went to undergrad with the intention of I'm going to go and work uh, for a nonprofit think tank organization. And uh, I, while I was at Liberty, I chose my major. It was going to be government, politics, and policy. And it was actually my freshman year. I was in one of my, you know, general ed uh, government classes and I met with my professor and I was asking her, you know, I don't know what minor to add and, you know, what, what would be a good minor? And she told me, well, you should add a, a pre-law minor. And I remember specifically telling her, uh, oh, I don't want to go to law school. I'm not trying to go to law school, a pre-law minor, that wouldn't be the right track. And she said, no, you don't need to go to pre, you, you don't need to go to law school if you add a pre-law minor, uh, but it will help with your analytical skills, your thinking skills, your writing skills, all, all the skills that you need to go and work for a think tank and possibly do research and writing. And so I was like, all right, I'll add the pre-law minor. So freshman year, added the pre-law minor, didn't take a single class from that minor uh, <laughs> until my senior year at Liberty. And so now here I am my senior year and I have all these law classes that I have to take and I'm kind of dreading it because I'm like, why didn't, you know, why did I save these classes to my senior yeah, year? Totally. And uh, ended up my fall semester of my senior year taking an appellate advocacy class. And my professor actually was a read Regent Law alum. I had never heard of Regent at the time. And so uh, I took this appellate advocacy advocacy class. It was one of the hardest classes I took, but I fell in love with it. I loved just the the challenge of the class, the idea of having kind of your mock, uh, a mock case and having to come up with uh, written arguments, presenting the arguments. And I just, I really, I really loved the class. And so 
uh, I remember at the end of the class, my professor telling me, oh, you should have done moot court throughout undergrad. And I was like, I didn't even know what moot court right, that meant. Word. <laughs> what is that word? Moot. What is that word? And so uh, I told him, you know, I, I kind of am feeling drawn to law school. I don't know the first thing about applying to law school. I don't know what that looks like. I don't come from, you know, I don't have any lawyers in my family. I don't even know if I'd ever spoken to a lawyer. And so... <laughs> Uh, this professor, he really just took me under his wing and, you know, helped me through the process of, you know, what it looks like to apply for or enroll for the LSA and the, the law school process. And so, of course, because I adored this professor, um, Regent Law was uh, top of the pick. And so uh, when I applied to Regent and got in, um, I was, you know, thrilled. There was a lot of, I mean, ways that the Lord just kind of made it clear that Regent was where I was supposed to go. Um, I actually didn't make the final decision until one week before student orientation started. So I was, after I graduated from Liberty, I moved back home to California and was just praying about, okay, is law school the next step? What does that look like financially? You know, what, you know, is this truly what the Lord is calling me to? And it was one week before orientation started. I remember uh, emailing, uh, Dean Hernandez at the time and saying, okay, like I have the green light from the Lord, like he's, you know, provided it in different ways. And so, you know, when do I need to be there? <laughs> he said, well, wow. orientation starts next week. And so, uh, I packed up, uh, my car and moved back to the East coast, back to Virginia and, uh, started Regent law in 2017. And, um, it, I mean, I could talk all day about Regent just because I loved, loved the experience, loved the faculty, wow. loved the classmates. Well, I wish we had all day for uh, you to talk about. That's kind of, you know, I'm a big fan of Regent. <laughs> That's uh, it's, right. It's, it's so cool to hear you talk. It's like full circle. Um, for people who went to law school and remember orientation, you know, orientation week's a little bit almost like boot camp to kind of like get people to be thinking law school's going to be harder than undergrad. You're going to have to do all this. And interestingly, this is a little full circle for me. Uh, when I came to Regent in 2019 as a 38-year-old 1L with a wife and three kids, you were kind of like the tutor for my class. Um, you probably didn't know. I don't know if we talked or anything like that. I was wow. <laughs> a terrified-looking, you know, older guy walking around. Um, but you and um, I think Charlie, Charlie, Charlie yep. Morris, Morris or Morrison? Morrison. Mm -hmm. Yes, Morrison. Um, you guys were picked as, you know, seasoned 3Ls who know what's going on and were teaching us study habits and all that. And we were all um, scared out of our boots. But why I bring that up is it's really interesting for you to talk about. I, I took this app ad class in undergrad, which is hilarious to take app ad without understanding law. I mean, that sounds crazy to me. And then I moved home and I didn't know what was going on and I didn't have lawyers in my family. I think a lot of people can relate to that. I have this inkling, a feeling of calling to go to law school, maybe even non-Christians, just kind of like, I feel like maybe I should be a lawyer, but it's this thing where you feel like people who go to law school know about it. They know these kind of things and I don't know what I'm doing. I think that's way more common than people realize. And it's really interesting for you to say, I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know this one week before orientation. And then three years later, the law school is picking you as the example of a student who knows what's going on at law school. <laughs> it's, it's really like, hey, if you want to be a lawyer, law school is a really formative process, you know. It, it really is. And, you know, it's, it's interesting that you say that because I think throughout my, my journey throughout law school and even now into practice, I go through those different periods of uh, imposter syndrome where I don't, I don't feel like I belong. And I, you know, I sometimes question, okay, wh why am I here? Lord, why have you brought me through this? But what I love about the Lord and even just my journey throughout law school, and I can look back at like the Lord's faithfulness. And that's why I love being at Regent because I had faculty, I had classmates that were pouring into me who could see gifts and skills in me that I necessarily couldn't see in the moment. And, you know, it, I felt like the odds were stacked against me in the sense of, I don't, you know, I didn't have a job in the legal field. I wasn't a paralegal or I didn't have attorneys, you know, in my family. Right. Um, but yet the Lord was still able to sustain me through that because he provided, you know, me with the resources, with the people who could encourage me. And, you know, that 
that follows me even, you know, today where I'm at, you know, even in my career, there's still times where I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing, but yet the Lord, you know, equips me, gives me the resources, provides me with the mentors that I need. Uh, but that's, I think, much more common than maybe law students talk about uh, because we think, you know, the other person has it all together and they know what they're doing. It looks like they know what they're doing. I'm the only one. And so it can be very isolating. Um, but they're not the only one. And that was part of the reason why I loved, you know, working and serving in the student orientation, because I, I so clearly remembered what it felt like to be that student sitting in orientation and thinking, I'm out of my league here. I don't belong here. But yet you know, this is where the Lord has put me. And so for each student that, you know, the Lord has placed in law school, that's the season that the Lord's called you to. And uh, it's easy to feel isolated in your own thoughts. And that's why you need community to to encourage you and remind you of, of what the Lord has done and is doing in your life. That's so good. And obviously both of us went to Regent Law, so we can't speak too much about other schools' experiences. And as always, I'm sure it's a spectrum. And it also depends on the person themselves. But I think we can both attest at Regent Law, the community of classmates and teachers jumping into that with you. I know for me, law school is hard as all get out. If a law school is excellent, it's going to be hard. Um, But I really loved my time here. Uh, Doing hard things with friends. This is our our, Dean Lingo's our dean now. He says that all the time. The joy of doing hard things with friends and, and mentors I, I found to be wonderful here. Um, well, I'm going to, I'm going to finish this section of the conversation where we're like basically at a homecoming reunion here for regional <laughs> and kind of, but, uh, excited to transition and talk about, uh, your recent victory in court. Um, so you said you practice a lot of religious liberty. So maybe just give us a 50,000 foot view of, of the case and, uh, we can go from there. Yeah. So uh, about a year ago, uh, well, a little more than a year ago, uh, we had a, a teacher come to our firm and reach out and share her story. And she had just recently been fired from her public school district. She was a physical education teacher. Uh, she had gone to a, a Christian undergrad uh, out here in California and then had worked her way up to being a physical education teacher. That was her her dream job. And uh, she is a, a follower of Christ um, and has been a committed teacher. She had, you know, glowing reviews from both her students and her, her, the supervisors and the district employees. And she uh, was fired from her job. Uh, And essentially what had happened is some students had found her own personal social media account. And uh, on her social media account, she had a tab that was like her Jesus highlight. And so she had different Bible verses, different quotes from different um, theologians. And uh, she also had posted a video of her walking through polls. It was actually Pride Month. And so she was walking through polls and she was in the toddler clothing section. And she was basically commenting about how, you know, we shouldn't be introducing, you know, gender identity uh, topics to our young children. Um, There's no place for that. There's no reason that there should be pride toddler clothing. And so she had posted this video on her social media account her social media account did not identify her as a, a teacher, a public school employee. It was just her own personal social media account. And so these students um, uh, ended up reporting some of these posts to the school district. And so her school district called her in and uh, she ended up having a series of uh, several different meetings. And uh, she was issued a notice of unprofessional conduct based upon uh, these posts and then um, just Uh, a lot of false allegations were raised against her. And so uh, to, in order for her to keep her job, uh, the school district gave her a list of directives that she needed to follow in order for her to remain employed with the school district. And um, um, the three significant uh, directives that they gave her, uh, one was that she uh, had to refer to students by their preferred pronouns Uh, she had to withhold that information from parents. So if a student had come to her and said, you know, I want to start socially transitioning, she wasn't permitted to tell uh, that student's parents. And then uh, thirdly, uh, because she was a a PE teacher, she had to allow boys into the girls' locker room. 
And so she said, you know, I'm, I'm a Christian. Uh, these directives uh, conflict with my religious beliefs. I, I can't, I can't do that. And um, something that's just interesting about her, her case is she had never had any student, you know, request to go by different pronouns. She had never had a boy, you know, asked to use the girl's locker room. Uh, so there was no actual incident that happened. Again, it all just stemmed from her, her social media posts that, you know, certain wow. students disagreed with. And so um, her school district said, okay, well, it sounds like you're asking for a religious accommodation. We'll need to, you know, see if there's a way that we can accommodate you. And so, um, oh, that's, that's my dog in the background. Uh, she, so she had uh, a third uh, meeting and during this meeting, uh, her school district basically just asked her questions up and down about, you know, how long has she been a Christian? What does it mean to be a Christian? What does the Bible say about, you know, this issue or that issue? And she was essentially These are the grilled. questions from her school board. Yes. And, and she's so thinking she, this is an employment conversation with my public school. And, exactly. Okay. Never did she expect that she was going to have to give a defense for, for her faith, but she, she did. And uh, her school district said, we can't accommodate you. And so we're going, if you're not going to follow these directives, we're going to let you go. And so uh, they fired her. And so she then came to us and, you know, said, this is what happened. And right away we knew uh, that there were some uh, very serious legal issues. There is the first amendment that protects her freedom of speech, protects her religious liberties and uh, something that, you know, has been a longstanding tradition, just even based upon Supreme Court precedent, is that uh, the government can't create its own religious test to hold public office. And that's essentially what her school district was doing was um, they were saying, you know, her, her name is Jessica. Jessica, you need to comply with our own religious beliefs regarding, let's say, gender identity. And if you don't, you know, comply with this religious belief or our religious beliefs, you're no longer qualified to serve as a public school teacher. And so thankfully we have the first amendment and Supreme court precedent that does not allow that. And so that was kind of the first trigger uh, that we, you know, as we were hearing her story. And then there was also uh, title seven uh, issues, which has to do with, you know, an employer is required to accommodate an, an employee's religious beliefs. And so we filed a lawsuit against the school district. And uh, for the past year, we've been uh, litigating this case, doing discovery. Uh, the school district had filed a motion to dismiss the lawsuit. And thankfully, um, the court denied that motion, allowing the case to continue. And so uh, we've been uh, just going through the motions of you know, litigating this case. And we had a couple of different mediation and settlement conferences with the school district to try to settle the case. And uh, Jessica, for her, um, this case was just very important. Not only was it her livelihood, she was married and had three young children, but uh, also just the principle of what it means to, you know, have religious beliefs and bring those into every context of your life. Uh, right. No person should have to essentially, you know, abandon their religious beliefs when they go, you know, walk through their their employer's door. Obviously, there are certain boundaries and limits, but that doesn't right. mean that you, you know, you leave those. Uh, and certainly in the public school setting uh, where we have case law that says, you know, both students and educators, uh, they don't abandon their religious rights at the quote unquote schoolhouse gate. And so. Uh, you know, in talking through, you know, do we settle this case? Do we continue? There was a lot of discussions on, okay, what message is this sending uh, to other school districts and then also educators? Uh, because, you know, Jessica's story sadly isn't unique. We see these kinds of uh, transgender policies, you know, being pushed across the board throughout lots of school districts. And it's not to say that, you know, transgender students do not have, you know, rights. They, they do, but uh, religious rights are not second class to any other right. And so yeah. um, we ended up having a, uh, I believe it was our third settlement conference with the school district. And we ended up settling the case uh, for $360,000, which wow. uh, was an incredible financial victory. That was three times uh, the salary that Jessica was owed. Uh, but more than that, uh, the school district was a pretty small school district. So that was a pretty big financial burden on the school district. And so um, you know, we believe the settlement, yes, the, the financial aspect of it is, is great for Jessica, but we think, you know, this sends a very strong message to other school districts that, you know, you can't burden a religious, uh, a person's religious beliefs. There's a price to pay uh, when that happens. And then we also hope that it, you know, equips and empowers other educators to say, okay, 
I need to take a stand for truth. Um, I have, you know, values and convictions. And so I'm going to, I see one teacher that has taken a bold stand. And so I'm going to do that as well. And uh, we hope that it empowers other teachers because I think right now we're seeing, you know, school districts are pushing out the kinds of teachers that we want teaching our children. Jessica is the kind of teacher that we want teaching our children. She um, loves children. She wants what's best for them. And uh, instead, you know, her school district saw her, uh, you know, as, as a threat. And something that's interesting is the school district would, you know, as we were going through this lawsuit, they would tell us, you know, we did what we did to Jessica because we were afraid of being sued by a transgender student. So we had to do what we did to Jessica. Um, and that completely misses the mark because what ended up happening is they faced a lawsuit from an educator of faith. And so there was, there was no incident in which, you know, Jessica, you know, violated the rights of a transgender student that never occurred, that never happened. Uh, but the school district did violate her First Amendment rights and also her Title VII rights. And so we're really excited about this this uh, victory. And um, for me, this was one of the first cases that I had started kind of from start to finish. I joined my firm um, in 2022. And so this was kind of my first case that I got to help lead. And uh, there were lots of moments where, you know, I, I felt, okay, in over my head and kind of like, okay, Lord, why, why do I, you know, why am I responsible for this? But, um, it just affirmed that, you know, this is absolutely where the Lord has called me. And I'm so grateful that, you know, I get to be in a job in a position where, um, I truly see it as a ministry. I get to, um, not only help my clients who are, you know, trying to live out their faith boldly, but also, you know, how am I representing myself as I'm discussing this with opposing counsel? How am I, um, maintaining my integrity. Uh, and, you know, I'm a, I'm a Christian and follower of Christ first before I'm an attorney. And so that's going to affect, you know, how I'm interacting with opposing counsel and how I'm talking about uh, the other side, so to speak. And so there was a lot of learning uh, curves for me in this case, but it was uh, truly, I have a great, you know, team and a lot of awesome attorneys that were able to help on this case. And um, we, we couldn't be you know, more proud to stand behind people like our client. And we have lots of other clients like Jessica. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, it's, it's been really great. Oh man, that is so exciting. I, I love what you said about, you know, it's one of the first cases from start to finish. I'm sure you just carried it so deeply in you for so long there. I've, I've got a couple questions. Um, uh, one about your faith and one about kind of your journey in the practice of law. Uh, the first one would be, you know, you and I are both uh, Christians. I love what you said. You know, before I'm an attorney, I'm an, I'm a Christian, and I, I carry my um, commitment and love for Christ in every situation, and that impacts. I've got a, I've got a question uh, for you. Um, why should non Christians um, celebrate a religious liberty victory in court? Yeah, that, that's such a good question. I, I love that because I think what's uh, special and unique about the First Amendment is it just it, it doesn't apply to just Christian beliefs. It applies to all beliefs and uh, any person, whether you you whatever faith background you come from or non faith background you come from, you right. have rights under the First Amendment. And so you can look at this case specifically and say, okay, well, this is a Christian, and it's you know she's trying to get her Christian beliefs promoted, which that actually you know wasn't even the case. She was simply asking just for an accommodation from you know essentially a, a different type of religious beliefs. We can call you know what the the district, these directives are based upon, you know, a certain ideology uh, regarding transgender issues. Yeah, it's a worldview. Everyone has a worldview. I, I like that word better. Everyone has a, a worldview. And so um, it's important uh, to to celebrate and to see the, the, the cause of this type of case because we want to preserve uh, any individual's ability to exercise their First Amendment rights, any, uh, any individual's ability to get an accommodation from something that dis- they disagree with because it conflicts with their their religious worldview or their biblical belief or whatever faith background you come from. And, you know, if we continue to just, you know, allow, you know, essentially say, okay, we're not going to defend the First Amendment anymore, 
uh, that's a very da- dangerous place to be in. And so for any American, right? For any American, well, every American. <laughs> yes, yes. And so I think it's very important to see, um, you know, regardless of, of the faith background that you may ascribe to or, or not ascribe to, uh, the first amendment is a bedrock principle of, our American history. And so, um, you know, it's not so much that Jessica wanted to proselytize. She, she never proselytized, you know, her faith. It's simply allowing her to be able to, uh, work and hold her faith dear to her just as much as, uh, you know, a Muslim should be able to work and hold, uh, her faith dear to them. Um, and you know, that's, that's why we have the first amendment. That's why we have a Supreme court, uh, you know, precedent that protects, our religious beliefs. And so it's, it's very important. It goes way beyond Jessica's case um, and more so to the point of how incredibly special and unique our country is because we have the First Amendment. And you know that's why I love the job that I get to do because uh, essentially every day I get up and I get to uh, work to defend the First Amendment and that's for uh, the, the Christian and that's for you know someone that maybe just has you know a different worldview or doesn't ascribe to any type of faith. Okay, uh, that ended perfectly uh, to my second question. You said I get to wake up every day, and I get to defend the First uh, Amendment, and that's uh, probably not where your legal career started. Um, so I'm an attorney as well. I, you know, sometimes I think graduating law school is like the most anticlimactic thing. You gra- <laughs> you graduate, and then you go back to the library and you study for the bar, right? And then you get a job or maybe you've already had one or you're searching for a job. It's, it's an intense thing, you know, um, and then you get a job and there's a couple of things I'd love to hear your thoughts on. First, you're thinking, when am I supposed to learn how to be a lawyer? You know, you have this big learning curve of becoming a lawyer, but what I want to hear from you and especially from what you just said is, did you start immediately practicing law in your passion area or one of your passion areas that this seems to be? And or has making uh, your legal vocation, should it be my passion? Is it my passion? Will I get to do it? What has your journey been like in regards to your passions and your legal career? Yeah, so actually when I uh, graduated from Regent Law in 2020, um, I uh, had accepted a job with the Department of Justice uh, in their Attorney General Honors Program in their Immigration Division. So I ended up uh, moving back to California and I was working for an immigration court in downtown LA. And uh, that absolutely was not my passion. And, you know- It sounds amazing. It it is amazing. And we need people to do immigration work, but it was, uh, I think it was actually a combination of things. I don't think it was necessarily just the type of law. Uh, It was during the pandemic. And so, you know, as a new grad, uh, I wasn't really getting, you know, the interaction or the mentorship that I definitely needed right out of law school. And so there was, I think, some other factors, but immigration just wasn't something that I was passionate about. And I think even working from the context of I was working for the court, so I didn't have, you know, clients that I was helping. I was right. you know, reviewing these case files and essentially writing opinions for judges. And there was a lot of good um, learning skills. And this is what I would even, t- you know, encourage other graduates or, you know, law students who may not get their dream job right out of law school is the Lord can always use uh, every opportunity. And so I was at that uh, job uh, for about two years and I could have, you know, looked at that as like, oh, that was a waste because I wasn't in, you know, my dream job, but there were so many different skills that um, the Lord, you know, fine tuned in me and different opportunities. Um, it wasn't a you know Christian environment, so there were actually a, lots of great opportunities just to talk with some of my colleagues about why I went to a Christian law school, um, and that was a lot of fun just to be able to share you know why I chose to go to Regent Law, and um, you know that just great. created different opportunities just in and of itself. And so, um, but it, it was difficult. There were times during those you know two years where I'm like, what, is this what I'm going to have to do for the rest of my career? Uh, you know, this what, is what I went to law school for? Yeah, like what's what's next? And uh, what's interesting is you know I had already always had a heart for religious liberty, but I didn't really think even in law school that I was necessarily going to get a job doing it. Um, a lot of times uh, these pro 
pro bono organizations, they like to hire more experienced attorneys or attorneys that you know are essentially retired from their practice, but now want to go and do a, a passion project uh, mm-hmm. and you know, defend you know constitutional issues. And so I had interned and clerked at the ACLJ during Regent, you know, throughout my time at Regent, but um, really was not thinking I could get you know a job shortly after law school in this field. And so uh, around shortly before the two year mark at the Department of Justice, you know, I just started looking at different law firms and started thinking through, okay, what do I want to do? Knew I wanted to do some type of religious liberty, perhaps religious discrimination. And so I was like, well, maybe I'll start looking at employment law firms. And so started looking at employment law firms. And then um, I ended up having a chat with my pastor at my church and was telling him, you know, I'm going through this phase of not sure, not sure what's next, right. looking for other jobs. And he was like, well, I know, um, you know, a couple of religious liberty law firms, and you know, I can connect you with those attorneys. And I said, okay, you can, but I already know, like, they don't hire young attorneys. I have no litigation experience. So, right. it, you know, it's not likely, but feel free to, you know, connect me. So he gave me the contact numbers of several different attorneys and unbeknownst to me, he had also sent my contact to a couple of those attorneys. And one of them reached out, I think the next day and left a voicemail and said, you know, I'm looking to hire, please call me, uh, let's chat. And so I ended up uh, calling him and uh, inter- in- interviewing and uh, getting a job offer with the now firm that I work for, Advocates for Faith and Freedom. And so that was, I mean, truly the Lord just leading me and guiding me to, to this firm. But I do want to just even note, because I can say this is the dream job. This is absolutely what I wanted to be doing. But uh, there are certainly times where I question, okay, Lord, is this where you want me to? This job is very difficult. It's rewarding. I love it. I love the type of law I practice. Um, but again, I have that imposter syndrome. And there are times where I think, oh, I could I go work anywhere else? Or could I be in any other profession? Could I be in an easier profession? Um but again, I have to come back to one, seeing how the Lord has been faithful in my entire journey of even, you know, getting me through law school and getting me through the bar exam and sustaining me through a job that I may not have loved. And I know right now this is like where the Lord has called me to. And so I look at it as being a steward. I want to be a good steward with what the Lord has given me to given me to steward. And so maybe I won't be here for my entire career. Maybe I, I will, um, but I want to, you know, honor the Lord in that and um, that's why I believe it's so important to be surrounded by mentors and by people who who know you and can encourage you. I actually uh, spoke to Professor Ben Madison a couple weeks ago because oh. I was I was feeling overwhelmed with just the wow. weight of my work, and you know called him up and just asked you know for prayer, and it ended up just being such an encouraging phone call, just and kind of reoriented me, kind of reset my focus, and uh, you know allowed me to see okay. These are just my doubts that I'm struggling with, the same doubts that I maybe struggled with in law school. Uh, but again, God is faithful. And so I'm going to, you know, work through those doubts and insecurities and say, you know, this is where the Lord has called me to. And so I, I love my job. I love what I get to do. Um, but there are there, those times where it's, you know, I, I question the Lord, question what he's called me to. Um, and that's why I look at, you know, his track record. He He's faithful and he's never not been yeah. faithful. And that's what I always come back to. That's really good. I, you know, a couple of things I hear you saying as you're, the struggle's real for all of us and mm-hmm. in it every day in life, um, you know, or just processing where we're at. And I would say, you know, the practice of law is particularly uh, a field that people can struggle with imposter syndrome and, and it's just hard. You know, some of the best jobs is uh, the reward is more work, you know. Um, two things I heard you say, though, is Sometimes you got to look backwards to look forward, see where the Lord's already been faithful as a a representation of his character that'll make, you know, having faith for that for the future easier. And then, and then just, it's not always just, you know, prayer or whatever. Sometimes you just got to ask somebody you trust. And I think it's really smart. You call Ben Madison, who was a litigator, who was a really good litigator and someone who's proven his his character and his joy in your life. And you called him. And I, I think, you know, that's just a good reminder, especially to attorneys out there, you know, in, in the practice of a law, it can grind on, on your personal life and people can struggle. So, so find somebody you trust, make a call, you know, and, uh, 
and pray. If you believe in God, he's good. Ask him about your situation. Um, well, man, I thank you so much for your time, Julianne. It's, uh, I think our listeners are going to be really blessed today. Before we go, I think what I'd say is, is how can people learn more about this case if they're interested to hear about it? And um, I can't remember if you brought it up in this call or not, but a campaign was kind of started out of this, I believe. So if you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So with the announcement of the settlement of Jessica's case, uh, we also launched a campaign, uh, our firm together with Jessica called Teachers Don't Lie, which basically just premises on the fact that teachers don't lie to parents regarding children. Teachers don't lie to children regarding their gender identity. And teachers don't lie to themselves by denying, you know, their, their convictions and their beliefs. And so uh, we launched this campaign. Uh, we have a website. It's called teachersdontlie.com. And we, we created this resource uh, essentially as a guide for other teachers, ed- other educators that are in this space that, you know, may just want to know what are their rights. And then also if they need a legal help, they can reach out to us as well. I think I mentioned earlier that we're a legal ministry and so we're a nonprofit. Um, and so we rely on donors who support our, our ministry so that we can represent our clients like Jessica for free. Uh, and so we, we want teachers and educators to know what their rights are and, you know, be bold and stand in their convictions and their faith. And our firm does, you know, not just, uh, this type of law. We do free right. speech. We do election integrity. We do parental rights. There's a lot of other areas. And so um, we have, you know, our website, faith-freedom.com. Um, and we, you know, list all the cases that we're working on. If people just are curious of knowing, you know, what, what kinds of cases do we do we handle and just want to know and keep up to date, um, you know, we have summaries of each of our cases and um, just really neat stories of, of all of our, our clients. Um, but Teachers Don't Lie is the campaign that we launched Uh, based off of Jessica's story. Fantastic. Well, if you want to learn more about Julianne's firm, that's faith-freedom.com and this specific campaign for teachers. If you are a teacher or if you're interested in this topic or know of a teacher who may need help in this situation or you just want to learn more about this dynamic in our country right now and support it, um, even pray, even pray for it. Um, That's teachersdontlie.com, correct? Yep, that's right. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Julianne. Thanks for your time. I know our least our listeners are really going to learn a lot and uh, enjoy listening to this. So hope you have a good day there on the West Coast. Thanks, Pat. All right. See you later.